It's my pleasure to welcome Professor John Methuen. Um, some of you also know John through the Hydro tutorial. Um, John and a lot of work along with Andy uh, to organize the Hydro tutorial for this summer uh, colloquium. John is a professor of atmospheric dynamics at the University of Reading. Um, John's research interests cover two distinct, distinct areas. Um, one of which is the dynamics of weather systems with an emphasis on the role of Rossby waves. And the second one is airborne transport of atmospheric constituents such as water vapor and pollution with an emphasis on chemical transformation during intercontinental transport. John um, is a co-chief editor for the QJRMS Quarterly Journal of Royal Meteorological Society and a co-chair of the WMO Working Group on Predictability, Dynamics, and Ensemble Forecasting. John's also the Department Director of Internal Partnerships at, um, at the University of Reading. Thanks, John. Look, looking forward to your talk today on relating- okay, Thank you very much, Manish, and thank you for inviting me to speak and, and to take part in the whole summer school. Uh, so the topic I'm going to consider today is, is actually related to the monsoons that we've been hearing about earlier today, uh, in that I'll be talking about uh, predictability and, and predictive signals in Southeast Asia in particular. And, and then I'll also talk a bit about relating ensembles to high impact weather scenarios with examples from the UK actually, forecasts in the UK which is obviously not really influenced by the one scene. Uh, so the motivation here is quite a broad one. We, we would like to predict high impact weather and, and of course the impacts. So floods, uh, wind damage, uh, you know, anything that where we have weather related damage and users want that information as far ahead as we can give it to them. Uh, but of course it needs to be useful information and we know that the skill, skillful range of prediction falls fast and is highly scale dependent. So, you know, we have kind of a naive prediction on just based on climatology from the seasonal cycle, but also in modifications of the seasonal cycle. We have longer range prediction from large scale modes, and we've heard a lot about that during the summer school. Obviously, synoptic weather systems, but it, it, we need to go even further downscale for the, the high impact weather variables themselves like uh, extreme precipitation or, or damaging surface winds and uh, so in, in this prediction we need to consider the handover from the most predictable scales to the uh, less predictable things that we're actually interested in uh, and in particular in this talk I really want to address how we harness the more predictable phenomena to obtain useful forecasts of weather risk or risk associated with high impact weather. Uh, and sometimes people call this a kind of regime conditioned approach. So I'll explain that as we go along in, in several contexts. So first of all, we need to use ensemble forecasts. I think that goes without saying. Uh, and in this approach, we want to characterize the risk associated with the predictable phenomena. So you say, uh, a phenomenon is a, in a particular phase or it has large amplitude that might change the risk of some uh, high impact weather, for example, daily precipitation above some uh, high percentile. And then we use the ensemble, this is the dynamical ensemble, to predict the predictable parts, uh, not, not the precipitation directly. And then we obtain a regime condition forecast by uh, using the combination of that statistical information with the dynamical forecast. Um, and one complication which comes up most obviously in tropical cyclones, but you know, in many other contexts, is the ensemble may split into really distinct clusters. Uh, so that and forecasters need to identify this behavior and then and then use it in their communication, but it's not immediately obvious how to do that. So here's a good example. This is actually the forecast for today in the UK. And you notice it's, it's actually got an amber warning at the moment for extreme heat in the Southwest. Uh, so it's pretty hot in Reading actually, at the moment, we're kind of on the edge of that. 
In fact, let me put the laser point. So Reading's, Reading's about here. I don't know where it is. So in, in the UK and many other countries, they tend to accompany their warnings with a, with a risk matrix. So it basically conflates likelihood or you might the probability of a hazard with the potential impact of that hazard. And so today just makes it into the amber because they say it's medium likelihood and medium impact. So it's here. Uh, it's quite hard to get into the red category, but you know it does does occur, of course. And so the question is how you use ensemble information to determine where you are on that matrix. And in fact, uh, operational forecasters do that through a combination of quantitative and, and subjective means. So, so in this talk, I'm going to be using a couple of things as illustrations. So I'm going to talk first about Southeast Asia in particular, because it's a bit of a, a frontier in prediction. It's predictive skill is much lower for that region than it is in mid latitudes. Uh, in, in a particular sense, it, there is long range prediction associated with ENSO and so on, but uh, weather prediction is generally less skilled. To me. So I'm going to talk about direct prediction of precipitation. So that's using precipitation output directly from ensemble to, to, to make probabilistic projections. And then I'm going to talk about these hybrid forecasts where we take the predictable components and then use those with a statistical association with the high impact weather to do this kind of hybrid statistical dynamical forecasting. So I'll illustrate that first with equatorial waves, which are uh, thought to be quite a predictable component of the tropical atmosphere. Uh, and then I'll talk about weather patterns. So the different series, of course, these waves propagate and they propagate in a predictable fashion. Whereas the typical approach to weather regimes or weather patterns is to identify static patterns through statistical analysis of the data. So they're actually describing very different things. Uh, and so the approach here is we're going to use large scale and synoptic scale weather patterns. Uh, but in both cases, then we study the regime condition forecast using S2S ensemble. Uh, and then finally, if I have time, not sure, uh, I talk about how we uh, obtain multiple scenarios from the ensembles uh, when there's flow dependent predictability. But the illustration for that is for the UK. Um, so, uh, this work in Southeast Asia is really driven by quite a large project with the Met Office, or actually a collection of projects. So the Met Office actually ran their NWP system downscaling in, in a kind of nested sense in a semi-operational way for six months. So this was a very expensive operation. So they basically, from the global model, they had an 8.8 .8 kilometer kind of large regional ensemble. These are all ensembles, so each 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 member is nested in the global mem member and, and downwards. So there are 17 members. Uh, then there is a 4.4 kilometer model domain, which is obviously quite a bit smaller. And then the 2.2 kilometer uh, high resolution models. And they're basically, they're in these three locations because they're centered on Kuala Lumpur, uh, Jakarta and Manila, uh, who were the partners in this. So first of all, you have to look at the, you know, whether the model can actually simulate the thing that you're interested in. So we were interested in precipitation. This is estimates of daily accumulations of precipitation, so climatology for the three countries involved. And then this is day one into the forecast, so climatology of the forecast. So it looks reasonable at first sight, but obviously there are some pretty big deficiencies. Like for example, the model likes to put all the rain along these mountains on the west side of Sumatra. In the observations, a lot of the rain is actually over the ocean near the coast. But that part of that is that there's actually a chain of islands here just offshore, which are not represented in the model, even the high resolution model. So a lot of this rain is actually over these islands. So this is kind of one problem you have to deal with. You can see a similar thing going on in Java. You know, the, the model likes to rain on the mountains, essentially. In the uh, in GM, we see a lot of rain over the oceans. Although also, 
there are a lot of deficiencies with the rainfall estimate from GPM as well. So, you know, whether this is actually real is also quite hard to ascertain. So first of all, we have to think about how to evaluate these high resolution forecasts. So this is a typical approach using fraction skill score. So the forecast has, you know, the gray cells are where precip is occurring. So this might be like a convection example. And we, we would say it was successful if over the scale of interest, which is this neighborhood here, we've got just as many cells that are precipitating and as we see in some form of observation. So this might be radar or the GPM satellite estimate. Uh, so here, this is good because the fraction is the same, even though in the particular grid cell in the middle, this one is dry and that one's rain. Uh, so this just accepts that on the, the convective scale, we're never going to predict the location of individual updrafts. Uh, and then, then fraction skill scores just obtain from this comparison. I, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, but the important thing about fraction skill score is that you vary the size of that neighborhood domain, and then you get the measure of fraction skill score that basically increases, it asymptotes to a high limit. So it's only asymptotes, asymptotes to one if there's no bias in the forecast, otherwise you can predict what it asymptotes to. Uh, and it starts at a very, well, I guess it really comes from zero at, at, uh, on the grid scale. And then there's a kind of range of skillful and useful uh, scales. And, um, and typically we define the, the smallest skillful scale being when the fraction skill score is a half. Uh, and, and that's what we use here. Um, so actually then this is for these forecasts. So six months of forecast for Malaysia, Indonesia and the Philippines. And just focus on the red line. So the red line is where the fraction skill score equals a half. Uh, and then we've got spatial scale going along the x-axis and lead time going on the y-axis. So basically the skillful spatial scale increases with lead time, indicating that we're less and less certain as the forecast goes through. There's obviously a strong diurnal cycle, which is very typical in this region associated with the convection. So basically skill is larger in the daytime, actually from forecasts from about local midday and much smaller at night. And that's partly because the precipitation is over the ocean during the night, and the model's not very good at that bit. Uh, Philippines doesn't such a strong diurnal variation because a lot of that associated with things like the tropical cyclone. John, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Actually, there is scale. I think your audio was breaking up. Maybe for bandwidth three, since you could switch off the video. Oh yeah, so I switched I it off, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, is that better? Yeah, it's better. All right. Thanks. Oh, hang on. Oh, there we go. So they, the skill also varies with location. So actually, this is the day, uh, basically day one forecast. The, 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 the gray shading, you know, above, uh, within the red lines is basically where there's most skill. So you can see there's more skill over the land actually. And actually in this region of the sea, there's less skill in other regions. So it's, it's, it's interesting to characterize that. These are for longer lead times. Very the numbers here don't quite make sense, but this is basically the next day and the day after. So now, so that's attempting to forecast the high impact weather directly using the dynamical model. So now we're going to try and do it without using the precipitation from the model. So, so first of all, look at equatorial waves. So there, and when we've shown from data that they're associated with high impact weather. In fact, uh, with Kelvin waves, for example, uh, extreme rainfall, so you can actually look at higher percentiles than this, it, it is up to four times more likely when you're in the right phase of the Kelvin one. So, so if you can predict the Kelvin wave, you're predicting the risk of precipitation, that's the general idea. And they have very distinctive structures and they have distinctive phase speeds 
uh, and, and Falco Jutes and a number of other people have argued that potential predictability in the tropics is very high uh, due to the presence of these waves. Although, as I show later, the actual predictive skill in current systems isn't, isn't that good. So there's a lot of potential predictability, which is unrealized. So the basic method is that we take global analyses, we identify wave amplitude and phase, and then we find the statistical association between high impact weather at every grid point or in every neighborhood with wave amplitude and phase. So we get conditional probability in wave phase space, you could call it that. And then we take global NWP forecast. I've just shown you, you could use model precipitation directly, although actually the precipitation from the global models is, is, is really poor. Uh, a unique convection permitting models really. Uh, but anyway, from the global NWP, you can forecast wave amplitude and phase. You combine that with the statistical information, you get a forecast probability of that weather. So it's it's bypassing the use of the model precipitation. This is what the waves look like. So actually our identification method is a spatial projection method onto these structures. So these structures come from theory. There's a few parameters to fit, but it, it's fairly straightforward. So we're particularly interested in Kelvin waves here and these westward mixed Rossby gravity waves. So these have meridional wind at the equator, Kelvin waves have zonal wind at the equator. So here's an example of that statistical relationship. So the, the color fill is uh, the GPM, oh actually it's trim, it's a bit older, it's trim precipitation, but the satellite estimate precipitation. And the contours are where there's convergence in the Kelvin wave. So when there's the Kelvin wave has high amplitude here, the precipitation is more or less with the convergence, not, not very surprising. But you can see there's a lot of structure in where the precipitation is. And so the statistical association knows that information. And then here's another example for a, a westward mixed Rossby gravity wave. So here the centers of action are off the equator, although the meridional wind is strongest on the equator. And you can see there are heavier precipitation in these solid contours and, and, and there's reduced precipitation or suppressed precipitation on the other side of the equator. Um, so these are the kind of signals that we're looking for. And these propagate. So this one is propagating westwards. The Kelvin wave is propagating eastwards. So that's the predict predictable signal. Um, so then how do we use that? So this is then, sorry, each of these, this is Western Indonesia, Southern Indonesia, Northern Indonesia, and Eastern Indonesia. So we just split it into sectors. And then the wave amplitude is given by the radius in each of these diagrams. So we just split that into three bins. And then phase is split into four phases. That's partly because we've only got, uh, the waves move quite fast and we've only got six hourly data. So, so four phases is about the best that we can do. And um, as you might expect, a fraction of time in any one phase at a, at a given lo location is roughly equal probability uh, because you know the same wave is propagating through. So it just depends on the phase of the wave. But uh, when you calculate the conditional probability of heavy precipitation given wave phase and amplitude, you can see that that probability is much, much higher when we've got high amplitude and we've got the convergence phase of the Kelvin wave in all of these locations. So this is the degree to which this is much larger than all the other boxes uh, tells you how much potential predictability you have. Uh, if, if this was a flat diagram, you'd have no potential predictability. You might as well just give up there, I think. But this, this indicates that we've got a, a fighting chance. And actually it's quite large. So, High impact weather defined by this particular percentile threshold is the probability of high impact weather where we're in this region is 30%. I mean, that's really quite a high probability. So can we predict the waves? I mean, of course, that's the next question. Uh, yes, to some extent. So just focus on the dotted lines here. 
this is the skill and the Kelvin waves versus lead time. I don't have time to explain all the other curves, but basically from the analysis, it drops off roughly linearly lead time. Skill's getting a bit marginal by day six. Uh, the other waves, like the Rossby one here, has a bit more skill out, out to longer lead times. So this is just the state of the art. This is where we are currently. And it's pretty similar in other systems. This is in the Met Office uh, ensemble. So now we're going to jump to other predictable components uh, over the region. Because although our equatorial waves have a lot of potential predictability, uh, the models are struggling to forecast them beyond, uh, beyond a week. So then if you want to look at lead times beyond a week, I think you have to look at something else. So let, let's think about middle attitude predictability. So this is actually a diagram produced by Lara Ferranti, who spoke last week, of course. So this is a middle attitude example where as lead time increases, uh, we're looking at the, the projection of the forecast or the, or the split of the ensemble between different Euro-Atlantic patterns of variability. So the red one here is blocking. So, so we know pretty well that these really large scale patterns have skill in the S2S range. Uh, whereas weather types or things like gross Wetterlagen or, or the, the very old lamb weather types in the UK, they don't have much more skill than individual cyclones. So there, there is skill in the five to 10 day range. Uh, individual cyclones, maybe three to seven days, if you actually want to forecast the amplitude and, and position of the cyclone. Uh, frontal features are actually quite predictable given that they're so narrow because they're completely slave to the to, to cyclones. Uh, so, you know, in somewhere like the UK, there's very high predictability for the fronts. But the, the actual high impact weather phenomena, there's very low predictability low predictability, you know, typically less than two days. And this is where the high resolution forecasts come in. So we're going to use this thinking to think about Southeast Asia, which hasn't been explored in this way before. So we're going to take a two-tiered approach where we define a really large domain. In fact, this is a fifth of the Earth's surface. And we look for patterns of variability uh, using the data, basically using a k-means clustering approach in fact, we precondition the data using EOFs just to truncate the data set, and then we do k means clustering, which is a usual approach. And then we take a secondary domain within that, which is just spans Southeast Asia, which is actually a quarter of the area. So these kind of ratios are deliberate. So we're trying to separate skill scales artificially in a clustering approach, uh, and it and it's then, then in the second tier, we limit the data that's going into the clustering to only those, de those days that are in, in one of the tier one regions. So we, the tier two is deliberately a subset of tier one. So it's like looking for the weather regimes that are important when we're in regime of tier one, basically. And so this is the diagram kind of indicating that. So we've got eight tier one regimes and then we have all these tier two regimes as subsets of those. Uh, and I'll show you what they look like a bit later. Uh, and we did compare it with a flat approach where we just used the same number of regimes but adjusted the clustering over Southeast Asia straight away rather than the conditional approach. Uh, but I, I, I won't spend much time describing that here. Um, I, I should say the cluster variable is wind it's not precipitation, it's 850 hectopascal wind. That's because it's quite a predict, it's more predictable variable. Um, so let's look at the tier one clusters first. So this is day of the year. Uh, and then this is all the years in the data set from 1979 to 2017. And then the color is just the cluster assignment. Uh, so you can see to start with that the the tier one clusters primarily pick out something that's related to the seasonal cycle. I mean, that's really obvious. Uh, perhaps what's less obvious is that if you then reorder the years by phase of ENSO, there's actually quite a strong ENSO signal in there. So in, in boreal winter, 
uh, the cluster two is 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 related more to uh, La Nina, and cluster one is related to more ENSO conditions. So you can see that in the transition from uh, orange to blue, and also that some of them, which are related to the summer monsoon, Asian summer monsoon, there's clearly uh, dependence on ENSO in in the timing of the regime. So basically, it's a lot later in El Nino than it is in La Nina. So the, the clustering has picked out this information. We didn't impose any seasonality. We just gave it the full data to see what happens. And if you look at the, the regimes, they, they make a lot of sense. So regime one and two are both northeast monsoon, you know, in DJFM. It's just this one is more active in terms of precipitation than that one. So sorry, the color bill is the precipitation. Uh, whereas regimes four and five are summer monsoon and regime five is a more intense summer monsoon, which is also extended a lot further east uh, than in regime four. Uh, and, there, and then there are transition season regimes. So then we take that into the next tier. And uh, you know, there are 51 of these, so I can't show them all. Just, just pick out a few, which are quite interesting. So some of these are related to what are called cold surges in this region. So Grand Central 2B here, there's a really strong cross equatorial flow between Borneo and uh, Malaysia, well, Borneo and say Sumatra. This is called a cross equatorial surge associated with heavy precipitation in Java frequently. So this is, this is a kind of large synoptic scale regime. This one here is related to the boreal summer interseasonal oscillations. So actually quite similar to uh, Nina's talk where she was talking about the monsoon interseasonal oscillation. This is a kind of variation on that. Um, and that's coming out of one of these regimes. Whereas some of them are clearly related to synoptic scale events. So these are just tropical cyclones being in preferred regions. Uh, near the Philippines, and they're coming out in the clusters as well. So now the question is whether there's any skill in forecasting those things. So, so we've taken Glossy 5, which is the Met Office S2S forecast. Uh, we've taken a whole load of hindcast. So it's a fairly recent version of the S2S system, but the hindcast will be color, cover an earlier period. And we just take all, all, all the hindcasts that there are. Uh, and then we assign each ensemble member to regimes based on the era, cent era five centroids. So this is another decision you have to make. You could do all the clustering on, in the model world, but we decided not to do that. We decided to project the forecast into the clusters we identified from data. And that, that, that's a fairly typical approach. So one thing that we learned straight away is obviously there are lead time dependent biases. So this is the tier one. Well, in fact, it's all of them. You can see all of the clusters here, but the colors are the tier, tier one. So you can see that there's a lead time dependent bias. Lead time is running out here to day 36 between these two regimes. So basically in, in the data, this one's occupied a lot less than the red one, but uh, towards the end of the forecast, it's the other way around. And this is actually because in the model, the, the Asian summer monsoon extends from too far east in the model. That's just a systematic bias, and so, but you can see it's lead time dependent. But actually, the other ones aren't too bad in their representation. There's perhaps some ENSO dependence here between the red and the blue, uh, or orange and blue. So now we're going to use this information to do the regime condition precipitation forecast. So the direct precipitation forecast would just use the output of precipitation from the Gossy 5 model to forecast the probability of precipitation location X exceeding the 90th percentile. Uh, but instead, we're gonna take the probability of being in a regime and which is forecast by Gossy 5, and then the data the, the data relationship between the probability of precipitation ex exceeding the 90th percent or conditional on being in the regime. So it's a conditional probability. And then we combine that with the forecast probability of the regime 
to get the conditional forecast probability of precipitation exceeding the percentile. So it's a typical kind of combination of probabilities problem. This is this is quite remarkable. I, I still can't believe the results, and we've been checking these quite a lot. So this is now the blue one is the tiered uh, cluster approach, and this is uh, prior skill score in the in the exceedance of 90th percentile precipitation. So there's a skill on the face of it right out to beyond 20 days, uh, and and the the flat one is less skillful, which is quite interesting. So it's important to separate these scales and the clustering. But then we we try aggregation of precipitation up to more grid points because you know the S2S models have just got these one and a half degree data in well at least in the S2S database so we aggregate up to more grid points it doesn't change the range of skill that much although it changes the value of the skill score uh, but this this is the straightforward use of the model precipitation basically even with aggregation up to 500 kilometers the skill dies to zero in two days. So, so somehow we've gone from two days to 20 days by doing raging condition forecast, which is amazing, really. I mean, it, we don't get that gain in mid latitudes, nothing, nothing like it, but in the tropics, it's really uh, important. So here's, here's a case study just to bring that to life. Uh, so this is the it's in a particular week, actually, only in December 2019. This was the exceedance uh, above 25 millimeters per day, uh, daily accumulation uh, from the observa observations over that week. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to forecast. Uh, and then these are the forecasts from the ensemble at day, well, kind of, day zero to six, which we're calling week zero here, and then week one, two, and three. So you can see, you know, there's actually quite a strong resemblance to the observed ex exceedance. And, and this is where the skill is coming from. So for example, the south or western end of Borneo, there's obviously prob probability of heavy precipitation there and over Java. Uh, right, so now I'm going to change tack in the remaining uh, 10 minutes. Oh, uh, John, maybe like if you could oh, no. wrap up in three, four minutes, so we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I got, got confused on my time there. Yeah, Th this is very short, this bit anyway. So, so this is now focusing on a UK example. So, again, it's applying a clustering technique, but in a different way. We want to identify whether in an ensemble forecast there are several plausible options. Uh, so the, there are 18 members in the basic ensemble here, and we want to reduce that to two or three uh, important scenarios. And they need to be temporally consistent. Um, so what we do is we're, I mentioned fronts are important for the UK. So we get a frontal diagnostic using the gradient of wet hole potential temperature. And then we look at the position of features in this diagnostic. So in fact, we threshold that field just to get feature features, and then we calculate the distance between those distance between ensemble members using fraction skill score. Uh, so basically, you can relate distance to the neighbourhood where the fraction skill score uh, is large. That kind of indicate, indicates the scale you have to go to for match. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we've got a whole ensemble here. And the ones with the color frames that are the match are the ones that are falling into the same cluster. Mm. And uh, let's take a look at this one. As lead time increases, the ensemble spread increases, but we're looking for the point where the sum of distances between all pairs of members suddenly reduces, which indicates that there's clustering behavior. So we kind of start a time window when clustering behavior occurs. Uh, and then look at what happens. Mm. This top picture just shows the, the, the associated between members in each cluster. So cluster zero is typically got the most members in it. And we're interested in this time window here. So members do skip around between clusters, which is difficult, but uh, we try and look for the ones that are, are coherent through time. 
And what was kind of fascinating by this, here we've got start time versus lead time. So things on the diagonal are at a common validation time. Or, or, so in fact, on this ensemble spread, the top picture, there are particular events in the flow where ensemble spread is large, no matter how early you start your forecast. So longer forecasts would have a rapid spread, short forecasts have a rapid spread. And we find that clustering, so the dark blues here is where there's strong clustering, that's just related to where the, the ensemble spread increases rapidly, which is what you might expect. But what's interesting, that means that there are coherent things going on in the flow where, we, where, we, where there really are uh, clustering of ensembles, which are not dependent on the forecasting system or the lead time at which you start. These are properties of the atmosphere. And here's, here's a movie showing this. So in this case, four clusters work best. And the different colors are different ensemble members, but just overlain uh, if they fall in the same cluster. So this is what we're trying to achieve. And, uh, and at the moment, we're trying to investigate whether these are indeed associated with different high impact weather scenarios. And this is an advantage of this approach. You can look at any field because each of these members is actually just one member of the ensemble. So you have every variable that you have in an ensemble forecast. So I'll, I'll just summarize there. So, you know, obviously there is skill in direct ensemble prediction of variables, but it can be quite limited for some variables like precipitation, particularly if convection is dominant. dominant. And even with a convection permitting model, that's true, because the convection itself is inherently less predictable. So it, it is useful for longer range to use these hybrid methods. And there's been lots of talk of that, similar things over the last two weeks. So here we tried it conditional and equatorial waves, and also on these kind of clustering approaches, where two tiers indicate different scales. And it's, you know, it's amazing how much further you can get in predictive skill, even without time aggregation on, on the lead time. Uh, and then, then, you know, given that we have skillful ensemble forecasts, we have to think about how we're going to use them. And so I think do need to think about different scenarios that could occur in longer range forecasts, because ultimately that risk matrix that I presented right at the beginning needs to be different for each potential outcome. Uh, you can't just present one risk matrix for one ensemble when there are actually two distinct scenarios. So that, that's, that's where I'll end there and invite questions. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks for a great lecture. Thank you.